Uh, good evening and welcome to the uh, meeting of the San Francisco Ethics Commission. Uh, my sincere apologies to my fellow commissioners, to the staff, and to those in attendance uh, for my delay. Um, I know this rain is very good for our region, but uh, not great for traffic, as you can imagine. Uh, we'll begin by taking the roll. Uh, Commissioner Rennie, or, I'm sorry, Commissioner Rennie is on his way, but, but not uh, yet here. So we'll start with Commissioner Keene. Here. Commissioner Andrews. Here. Uh, Commissioner Hayon is excused today. First item on the agenda is public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda that are within the jurisdiction of the Ethics Commission. The next item on the agenda is uh, discussion with the city's, city attorney's office regarding potential litigation by the city attorney's office against local committees. Jesse would like to recuse himself from beginning. Okay. Uh, I understand Mr. Minardi has an announcement. Thank you, uh, Chairman Hur, Jesse Minardi, Deputy Executive Director. Um, I just want to say on the public record that I will not be uh, participating in this item. Thank you. Public comment on uh, agenda item number three. Good afternoon, uh, commissioners. My name is Charles Bell. Uh, and Janet Riley, and in late 2000. 10 uh, filed uh, the initial complaint uh, with both the Fair Political Practices Commission and this commission uh, concerning uh, a number of uh, what we believed were violations of <clears throat> both the State Political Reform Act and San Francisco's uh, campaign finance ordinance. I find myself here uh, just almost four years uh, from that date uh, and I would like to have had some correspondence with the Commission already, and I believe you have copies of the complaint that we filed as well as the subsequent correspondence that is pertinent to this. Uh, the most significant fact, I think, uh, and the reason that I'm here uh, uh, respectfully and urgently to request your action uh, is that uh, the Fair Political Practices Commission uh, at its November meeting approved a stipulation uh, between a campaign consultant uh, and uh, the uh, Common Sense Voters San Francisco 2010 Committee, uh, which at the time our complaint was filed, we believed to be uh, a committee actually controlled by a different candidate, uh, Michaela Angelo uh, Aliotto Peer uh, and not uh, uh, Mark Farrell, uh, the candidate who was uh, the uh, one supported by uh, this alleged independent expenditure committee. <clears throat> the FPPC stipulation uh, disclosed for the first time and I, we believe constitutes an admission by uh, that uh, committee that it was in fact controlled by uh, Mark Farrell. Uh, this is an unprecedented situation, I think, in campaign finance law in this state. I've been practicing campaign finance law in this state uh, for about 33 years, and it's never uh, come to uh, any uh, resolution that a committee that ostensibly was an independent expenditure committee actually was controlled by uh, the candidate that it benefited. Uh, so this is why uh, your action, I think, uh, your action on this is urgent. Uh, there were violations of the Political Reform Act that were conceded, uh, but there are other violations, uh, which some of which we did not even anticipate when we filed our complaint in 2010, uh, relating to the control of this phone <laughs> independent expenditure committee uh, by a can't the candidate that benefited from it. Thank you, Mr. Bell. <clears throat> Final comment. I believe you should undertake this in closed session and consider action in closed session. And uh, if needed, uh, we can provide information that 
the statute of limitations that might be applicable has been told by fraudulent concealment. In this Thank case. you, Mr. Bell. As this matter relates to uh, potential litigation, is there a motion to go into closed session? So moved. Public comment on whether to go into closed session? Uh, is there a second on the motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. We will move into closed session. We are back in open session. Uh, is there a motion to? Um, I don't think we're on. Oh. No, it's still. Uh, okay, that that we're not. Okay, there's nothing on the screen. Okay. Um, is there a motion to uh, keep confidential our discussions because they relate to potential litigation? So moved. Second. Uh, public comment on whether to keep the communications confidential. Uh, seeing none, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes. The next item on the agenda is presentation by students at UC Hastings. <clears throat> Commissioners, Jesse Minardi, Deputy Executive Director. I'm on this side so I can introduce uh, the two presenters of our next item, uh, Sally Hong and Lena Germanario two students at uh, UC Hastings taking a seminar with the Hastings Center uh, for State and Local Law. Um, earlier this uh, summer, commission staff uh, contacted and spoke with uh, Professor David Young, who is there back, back here, um, uh, the director of the center about developing a program and a partnership with that center so that we could help students gain sort of real life experience uh, in the political law issues that we deal with, but also we could benefit from their uh, time, uh, intelligence, and efforts. So this fall, we initiated that relationship and that program, and we were uh, lucky enough to benefit from the good work of Sally and Lena, who prepared uh, these six uh, fact sheets regarding the lobbyist ordinance, which was just amended um, in um, June of this year. And their uh, task, and what they were asked to do was to uh, review the ordinance, review the regulations that you passed uh, in July, and to provide uh, clear, easy-to-read guidance to the regulated community and the public so that people with their initial questions uh, could get it answered in, in a sort of a short fact sheet. So they uh, did that, and it was um, really nice working with them, and they've provided feedback. They were asked to provide feedback on what they thought about the ordinance, um, and they're going to be here to uh, present it for the next few minutes. So here they are, uh, Sally and Lena. So I'm going to set up the um, presentation real quick. Welcome. Good evening, Chairperson Her, Commissioners, and the members of the public. My name is Sally Hong, and this is Lena Germ Germanario. We are students of UC Hastings, and we are here today to present to you the fact sheets for the San Francisco Lobbyist Ordinance. And the presentation will be as follows. First, we will discuss the background of how our project came to fruition. Then we will give a brief summary of what the project is about. Third, we will explain the process behind the development of our fact sheets. And lastly, we will share what we learned from this process, what we think of the law, and about working with government agencies. And we will end our time with the Q&A session, so please reserve your questions for the end. So first, as Jesse mentioned, this was a collaborative effort between the um, Center for State and Local Government Law at UC Hastings and the San Francisco Ethics Commission. And as Jesse said, government agencies can submit submit proposals to the center, and then students get to pick a proposal to work on and get hands-on experience with real-life issues. We selected this particular proposal because first of our personal interest in political ethics. 
Secondly, because of the clear, we, um, second reason is because of the clear agency objectives that were in the proposal. The clear proposal seemed like it would enable us to develop, delve into the material more deeply and get a more thorough educational experience from working on this project. Consequently, because of our interest and the clear proposal, we chose this project. And this project is about, as you know, developing fact sheets to synthesize the important inf information in the lobbyist ordinance into plain language. And the three goals of this project are as listed on the screen. Um, we understand that the end goal was to develop fact sheets that would explain the San Francisco lobbyist ordinance in a clear way that the, such that the people who need to understand the lobbyist ordinance would understand it. That would be the lobbyists, or rather people who need to register as lobbyists. So how exactly we address these objectives um, started to change, actually, from what we had previously expected through the process of the project. So Lena is going to talk about the process. Okay, so um, I'm going to kind of walk through the key decision points we made in this project and the rationales behind them. Um, so when starting this project, we realized we had two sort of key goals. Um, we had to understand the law fully ourselves, and we also had to figure out how to create the most useful end product for our audience, which is lobbyists or um, people who need to register as lobbyists. Um, so in order to accomplish the first goal, we read and reread the statute several times, um, and we created a memorandum explaining the law to a fictional lobbyist and explaining their key obligations under the law to the best of our knowledge. Um, and Jesse and Pat reviewed our memos and gave us feedback. And sort of the goal of that entire process was just to make sure that um, we fully understood the law before we drafted fact sheets to explain them to other people. Um, and then we started to work on the fact sheets themselves. And some of our key decision points were how to divide the law into individual fact sheets and which parts, which uh, substantive parts of the law we would focus on. Um, and then at this point, we sort of hit a big realization that we, our, our problem framing needed a little bit of work. Um, we realized that we still needed to know what was the key problem that lobbyists were having with the ordinance. Was it an issue of active circumvention of the law? Or was it an issue of coherence and clarity of the law as it was written? Or was it an issue of confusion? Uh, were people, individuals, not sure that they were lobbyists and not sure that the law applied to them at all? Um, and so to answer that question, uh, one of the things that we did was to reach out to registered lobbyists from the uh, database, the Ethics Commission database, and interview them. Um, and the answers we got were not always consistent, but some of the main takeaways were that they generally understood the law pretty well. Uh, there were some gray areas that needed clarification, especially um, regarding the contact section and the exemption for attorneys. Um, but most of them were pretty comfortable with the law. So based on that information, we realized that we had to reconfigure our idea of who, who was our target audience, um, since these registered lobbyists already seemed pretty comfortable with the law. So we again spoke to Jesse and went back to him, and he clarified that we should really tailor the fact sheets towards um, people who did not know the law very well, uh, people who may not even know that they qualified as lobbyists and they had to register. So to accomplish that goal and meet th uh, the needs of that audience, we decided to structure our fact sheets uh, a little differently um, to make it really easy for people to understand their status under the law. So instead of speaking in terms of uh, contacts the way the ordinance does, by defining a lobbyist as a person who makes a certain number of contacts and then defining what a contact is, we, we tried to speak just in terms of contacts. Um, and we tried to condense the long list of exceptions to what counts as a contact into uh, a shorter form. So I'm just going to show uh, a sample, um, sort of show the ordinance first and then show um, our end result in terms of the fact sheets just for a comparison. Um, so this, as you can tell, is the relevant portion of the ordinance. Um, on the left, it's kind of a small type, but just, you know, uh, on the left, it's the definition section of who is a lobbyist, and then on the right, it's the section describing, you know, uh, what counts as a lobbying contact. And then next I'm going to show how we translated this into a fact sheet. 
So I, I believe you all have, you know, a digital version you could look at, but we feel that this is a lot easier for someone who's very unfamiliar with reading statutory language to just pick up and go chronologically and determine whether the law applies to them. It's easier for those of us who do know how to read statutory language, too. <laughs> I bet. Um, so, and then moving to the next one. So this is kind of the landing point fact sheet that someone would see, you know, do I qualify as a lobbyist? And then the next, they would go to the context fact sheet, um, as you can see. So, um, but in our main takeaways from this project, we learned a lot about the law and how statutes operate in practice. And one of the major things I sort of learned is that um, statutes aren't always written in a way that makes it easy to comply. Uh, they're written to reduce ambiguity and close loopholes, but not not always in the friendliest way for someone trying to pick it up and follow it. Um, so that's why when we made our fact sheets, we decided to break the, break free from the, the structure of the statute itself and make it, you know, more of a bullet point and sort of chronological format. And for me, like, to go off what Lena said, I think to understand statutes, um, I learned that you need to also look at the people who apply it, apply it daily. And in this case, um, I think without Jesse and Pat telling us how certain sections of this ordinance was applied, it would have been very difficult for us to know um, what certain sections were about due to the complicated language. For example, I think Lena showed you the sheet for um, lobbyists, like lobbyist contacts and the definition of a lobbyist. And um, if you look at the language of the ordinance, it says it's, um, the term lobbyists and lobbying activities and contacts are all connected. And, the, and, the, and an issue arose because the term lobbyist is defined primarily in terms of how many contacts are made in one calendar month. But lobbyist services also in, uh, indicates that contacts is only one part of lobbying um, and that there were other things that the lobbyists could do that would count as lobbying. So then we, had, we started to think about what um, was the main point of the definition of the lobbyist. Is it to define the lobbyist for the purposes of knowing what the lobbyist does? Or is it to define the lobbyist for the purposes of knowing when someone has to register as a lobbyist? And what approach do we want to take in our fact sheets? But in practice, these questions weren't as important. And it all came down to who needs to register. And if you're employed, and, who, and how many contacts you made, and who you're employed by. So the role of those who apply the statute was very important to understand the statute. And then finally, uh, both of us, I think, gained a lot from this experience to be able to, to do this work for the Ethic, Ethics Commission. Um, one of the main things we did take away is um, learning how to work on proposals from government agencies, which is something I think that's usually outside the purview of a typical law school education. Um, so essentially, we definitely learned that it's very important to know who your target audience is when you're creating a product that's going to go out to the public um, know who your product is intended for. Um, I think our fact sheets would have had a much different focus if we went with our original plan of tailoring them to seasoned lobbyists. So it's good that we clarified that early on with the commission. Um, and we encountered also an interesting research challenge because we weren't able to kind of get data about the people who uh, needed to register but hadn't done so yet because obviously they weren't in the database. So that I think that would be an interesting research question for the future for the Ethics Commission uh, to try to capture that group of individuals uh, so that the fact sheets can be sort of uh, distributed to them. And I also learned that when working for the government agency, it is very important to be able to work with the people of that agency. And Jesse and Pat were really excellent in helping us um, answering all of our questions and were really available through, throughout this process. And I say this is important because as the um, people who need to produce a certain product, we really needed to get into the mindset of the agency and what the agency wanted from the process. And through this process of working together, picking each other's brains, and bringing issues to the table, we were able to produce the final versions of the fact sheets that we have before you today. So this concludes our presentation, and we are now in the Q&A session. Well, Mr. Minario, Ms. Hong, thank you very much for your public service. Uh, this is great, and I think something that the city and county of San Francisco will really benefit from. So we really appreciate the effort that you put into it uh, and a great byproduct that you learned some things as well. Uh, so let me open it up to the commission for questions. Commissioner Keene. 
I want to compliment both of you and also Professor Young, uh, my colleague in the back from Hastings. I uh, uh, think you've done a fine job here in uh, putting this together. This is going to be extremely helpful to us as a, as a commission and also to people who are going to have to figure out what their responsibilities are under the statutes that we have, which are so complicated in their, their writing that we, we, we see all the time people running afoul of them just out of not being able to understand them. You, you've, you've reduced it to uh, uh, a wonderful simplicity, which, is, uh, which has been quite necessary. Let me ask you one question, though, that which I think, and it might be a little bit unfair, and if so, if you don't want to answer it, <laughs> feel free. But, but it, it, one of the things that w we take the opportunity of doing, because we're always trying to figure out who should be classified as a lobbyist, are our rules to... Uh, uh, too malleable, or are they strict? Uh, do, 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 in looking over this whole area of our regulation, do you did you see anything that, in your opinion, jumped out at you that hey, they've missed this that you could advise us on? Uh, it's something that we uh, we have our own sort of tunnel vision on at times, and we get an opportunity like this. Uh, with a couple of law students in particular who've looked at it with uh, your, your analytical skills. Did you have any kind of thoughts about those things that, that came up? Well, there was one thing I noticed, uh, or we noticed in the process, was that in terms of um, categorizing someone, you know, at which point does their contact make them a lobbyist, right? So there was one point where it said... Um, it, it categorized people depending on who their employer was, and there was one section, I believe, that was involving people who had 20% or greater share in a business, and I think there was some ambiguity as to whether if someone had, to say, a 10% share in the business, whether they would that would trigger a contact uh, in terms of lobbying, and I think we never really found an answer to that question. Does that make sense? Yes, that's, yeah. that's a helpful observation. That's certainly something that will... And also, I think, um, sorry if I... No, no, go please. But um, I think, um, are you talking about the lobbyist ordinance or the lobbyist regulations? Any of the stuff that you've looked at relating to lobbyists and re relating to regulation that you've seen that's within our purview? Well, I, w I was just thinking, looking at the um, regulations for counting contacts, it's, um, it's kind of complicated. Like, if you look at the regulations, um, count, because how you define or how you get someone to register as a lobbyist in the first place is you have to make sure that they have made a contact. And, and I think it de depends on, like, how many contacts you've made as well. So, um, like, for one type of lobbyist, it would be one contact. Some, another type of lobbyist, it would be five contacts. So counting the contacts in it by itself is very complicated. And I think there could be ways in which that area of the uh, law could be clarified. Thank you. Any other questions from the commissioners? I do want to commend you two. Uh, it was a great presentation. And as uh, I believe I'm one of two non-attorneys who are on the commission, it was very easy for me to read. So you, you, you get the layman's nod uh, from Commissioner Andrews. Thank you. Thanks. I'll make the comments unanimous as far as how well I think this is done. Thanks again, and thanks also to the Commission staff, uh, Mr. Minardi, Mr. St. Croix, and, and, and your staff, Pat, as well, for uh, all the input you gave, and, and this is a, a great product. And Professor Young, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment on item four, presentation from Ms. Hong and Ms. Germanario. The next item on the agenda is discussion and possible action regarding proposed legislation permitting ch uh, changing permit consultants reporting requirements. Um, so this uh, was referred to us from the board for comment. Um, it's not something we have a voting action on, although if the commission wishes to make comment um, on the, the proposed ordinance, 
um, they may. We don't have a lot of background information. Usually the legislative digest of a bill um, explains the impetus behind it. This one doesn't. Um, in the package of um, legislation regarding lobbying and extending registration requirement to permit consultants, um, there was a requirement in the legislation as it was adopted, the ordinance is written, that among other things, um, permit consultants would provide reports of the name, business address, email address, business telephone number of each person for whom the permit consultant or the permit consultant's employer received or expected to re receive economic consideration for permit consulting services during the reporting period. Um, the proposed legislation deletes the following language and the amount of economic consideration the permit consultant received or expected to receive. Um, I understand that Supervisor Chu introduced this on his way out on his way to the assembly and Supervisor Breed picked it up. Um, there was a hearing at the Board of Supervisors Government Oversight Committee last week that's explained in the memo that I gave to you. Um, continue to the call of the chair. Um, if the Ethics Commission wishes to make any comment on it, uh, we put it on the agenda for this meeting because they may possibly bring it back for consideration in January before our next meeting. I would suggest that we perhaps take public comment on this uh, to the extent anyone is here uh, on that matter. Any objection from the Commission before no. our discussion? Public comment. Hi, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Ryan Patterson. I'm an attorney here in the city and working with a group of mostly small mom and pop permit consultants uh, who do really the, the vast majority of permitting work in the city, uh, helping people to navigate what is a pretty Byzantine system to get permits approved. Um, we understand that most of the uh, rules here are not uh, in question. There's a, a very specific question today as to whether the permit consultant's fees must also be disclosed to the public. Um, this came about by accident, this part of the uh, law. As the negotiations went forward and came to a conclusion at the Board of Supervisors, uh, everyone, inv including Supervisor Chu's staff, understood that the final draft did not include this language. And uh, there are lots of representations about this. I think the supervisors themselves believed that this was not in the final legislation. And we've got lots of emails about this as well. Uh, but when the final legislation was passed, they took a look at it and found, lo and behold, this didn't get deleted as uh, was understood. So Supervisor Chu uh, engaged with this group and said, we're going to fix this. Uh, we'll introduce cleanup legislation, which is what's before you today. Uh, so that's how we've come to kind of an odd point with this piece of legislation. Um, it is a very important thing because while disclosing the permit consultants generally very small fees to the public provides no public benefit that we can see, uh, it does have a real impact on these folks. Uh, most of them, as I said, are small permit consultants, mom and pop operations, and uh, the only way this information is going to be used is by competitors from large uh, construction firms that will be able to see how much is being charged and then undercut it and build it into their own services. So there's a, an anti-competitive element to uh, what was supposed to have been removed from the law. And we, we really request that you would consider either not passing judgment on this and letting it go back to the Board of Supervisors in that normal process or support this legislation. Um, one possibility that could be considered is if the Commission believes this really is a problem and we need to know how much permit consultants are charging uh, their clients to basically fill in and turn in permit applications, um, you could set a threshold requirement that if you're receiving say $100,000 in fees, then you have to uh, disclose that to the public. Uh, and if it's less, then not. Uh, as for today, we would request, uh, if you are inclined to accept a continuance so that we can engage with 
the Friends of Ethics, who I think are the only ones who've spoken in uh, opposition to this proposed law. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Jeremy Paul, and I'm a permit consultant. Um, I think it's really interesting that this comes up directly after the, the previous matter that was before you. Um, I think it's really important to understand the distinction between what a permit consultant does and what a lobbyist does. We don't try to affect public policy, ever. Uh, we're not trying to uh, get something uh, done uh, 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 on a discretionary basis. What we're doing is using the clearly defined city codes that uh, city civil uh, servants are paid to implement. And all we're doing is carrying documentation from each of these departments. We're essentially glorified delivery boys. Um, if you want to find out who's paying us, it's very clear. It's always on the documentation, who the applicant is. It's, there's, there is no mystery. Um, who we're advocating for, again, it's all in the documentation. Um, yes, we do um, have to deal with um, these civil servants on a daily basis to get them to process the documentation we're carrying forward for them. Most of the people who are down at the Department of Building Inspection and at city planning every single day are helping the smallest property owners and the smallest building owners, uh, smallest uh, um, business owners in San Francisco stay in compliance and do what they need to do to, to stay in business in the most difficult city in this country to do that in, the most complex code overlays that exist. Making it possible for people like myself to function in this environment and to help these small business owners and small property owners is really what I'm here for. And I think that Mr. Patterson's suggestions of either setting a ceiling that suggests that if somebody's handling downtown property of uh, major proportion and they're getting fees in excess of $100,000, maybe there's a, a public interest in knowing what that's all about. Otherwise, there really is nothing but a, an enormous burden on the Ethics Commission, the Ethics Commission office, keeping track of the dozens and dozens of projects that I handle every month. Um, it's not like a lobbying firm that handles one or two clients and that's your, your business for a year. You know, I'm, I go to the building department with six permits to file and most of them are in the $100,000 cost of work range. This is not something that's of enormous public interest to record that information, but it is of great interest to those property owners and those business owners who need the work done. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Ahmad Larizadeh. I'm a licensed contractor. Uh, I've been with the San Francisco for probably 20, 20 something years. As a contractor, I was working. At the beginning, I was doing the construction. Finally, one day, I went there to the building department to get my permit. And I uh, figured it, I, it was very hard for me to get the permit. And I was watching people to coming through and really frustrated. So I decided, you know what, maybe this is a way for me because I. I'm very good with the, with the people and I can talk to them. And I left my construction company and started doing the consulting. Um, unfortunately, maybe uh, somebody, I hope you guys understand that's what we do. We are carrying like a postman. We, the, post, uh, the mail comes to the post office. We pick up the post office. We drive to the client. We give it to the client and we leave the place. Now, here is the problem that when we when we come to the plan checker in front of them, we don't know them, we don't know what's going to happen, and plan checker, we take a look, he make a comment, we take the comments back to the architect or client or, or, or whoever give us the drawing, and we take it back to them, comment comes back, we deliver it back to them, the permit approved. Then we walk back, we go either pay the fees or we call them up and say, hey, the permit is ready, here is what it is. Now, 
if you look at the pink application, they have all the information you need. You don't need to ask me. You can go to the computer right now, uh, sfgov.org, pool one permit, some addresses you see, who we're dealing with, who's the owner, who is the plan checker. Behind it is all sign off. If I, let's say, I write my report, I met Mr. X, you already have it in front of you. You don't need, you don't need me to tell you who I met or what I did. I just went and sat in front of him. This is my, am I guilty by sitting in front of the plan checker? He wrote the comment, do I have to report this to somebody that everything is documented in there? Do I have to tell him how much money I'm making? What about the money I lose, the, the, the people they don't pay you? I'm, I'm taking people to court to collect my money from my pocket to spend the fees. Do I have to report that? Are you, are you guys going to be concerning about that, how much I lost? And is it going to be beneficial for any of you guys to know if I make 100000 or make $10,000? I have Uncle Sam as my partner. At the, end of the, at the end of the year, I have to report my taxes. All my, all I, my, my client gave me the check, and I'm a construction company, and I have to report these. I cannot short to report them. Please ask me any question you want. I can explain to you. Everything is so simple. Everything is in the computer. And do you worry about me, how much money I'm making? Is it that difficult to understand? By looking at the permit, in, in the house, how can I tell my client, I need your name? Your name is there already. And how much you paid the fees right there in front of the, the plan checker? Changed it. Changed it from $100,000 to $200,000. What am I going to I have no control over this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Pam Harris. I'm a permit consultant. And I, I just wanted to come up and speak and um, let you know that I was in meetings that we had with, um, I'm not even sure what his title is, uh, Mr. Chu and Mr. True, his assistant. And um, we, we talked about, I'm sorry, um, we talked um, about um, many aspects of this bill um, because we are consultants. We're not what I would call lobbyists, we're not in the same um, category as a lobbyist in what we do. And uh, there were several issues that um, were discussed that were not to be in that bill, and he agreed to that. And one of those items was to disclose our fees. Um, I do multiple drawings per day. I pick them up from architects, engineers, um, homeowners, building owners, and shuttle them down, and then go through the process, um, plan check by plan check, desk, and they, you know, um, you know, by code, the, the drawings speak for themselves. And if they don't, then I go get revisions. So I, I but the main reason I'm here is to, to disclose that, you know, we are, we are, there are a lot of things that I don't think that we should do like a lobbyist would do, and that is disclose our fees. I think it's unfair. I, there's no way that I'm making hundreds of thousands of dollars per drawing. Um, you know that it's. I'm just a working person, um, um, and I don't know what else to say. But um, there's. I'd be happy to help anyone go through the system down, just to, to walk you through the system at the building department and show you exactly what we do. And um, I'm I'm here if you want to ask questions. Um, but anyway, um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Comments, questions for discussion from the commissioners, or Mr. Minardi, did you want to? Sir, Jesse Minardi, Deputy yeah. Executive Director. I just wanted to say that my understanding of the situation is, as uh, Mr. Patterson and Ms. Harris put it, that in fact, there were, um, at least at the meeting at which the board adopted this legislation originally back in June, there was a representation made uh, explicitly by then President Chu that negotiations had been ongoing and they came to a conclusion that a compensation would not be um, reported. Uh, and that this is uh, essentially the cleanup legislation. So um, one um, additional item of note is that um, the uh, permit consulting ordinance as it is now um, only triggers uh, reporting if uh, a project is 
a project, um, meaning the whole project itself is uh, valued at a million dollars or more. So there are thresholds, um, but not compensation thresholds. So, um, you know, it's conceivable that somebody might work on a big project but not make a lot of money on it because they're only one of a number of people who are part of that project. Mr. Keene. Could I ask, uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite clear what the posture of the question is before us right now, because as, as I originally understood it, Supervisor Chu introduced this legislation to make this change that the permit consultants didn't have to reveal what their fees were. Then it was then referred to us, the, the ethics committee. We, wanted, we, we had a referral to us as a committee as to whether or not we agreed with that or did not agree with it. Uh, and uh, then there was a question about whether or not our, we would have time to answer that question before the supervisors voted on it. Have they voted on it already? No. Okay, they haven't. No, no. So, yeah. so because it was originally on to be voted on. Last Thursday. Last Thursday. And, 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 and one of the things, the concerns that we were getting were from people saying, you're supposed, you ethics commissioner are supposed to weigh in on this, but the thing is going to be voted on before you get a chance to weigh in on it. So, so that, that, that hasn't happened yet. I think what happened is that uh, the chairman of the, the committee moved to table it, which would have, in a sense, killed it. In other words, it just it had to be brought back up. Then I think there was some continuance granted, and I think they're talking sometime in January where this may come back to them. Yeah. And as I understood it, and I may be wrong, that they simply were asking for a comment from us as to whether or not we agreed that this was, uh, with the deletion of that language. Right, okay, but but is it dead now? Or no, no. it's not? It okay. may come up in so January. It, it, it may come up in January. Yeah. Right. So yeah. we don't, but we don't know whether it will come up in January or not. Yeah. So, so this is our chance if it to weigh in on it before the supervisors vote on it, if it does come up in January, uh, if it, and if we don't weigh in on it now, and it does come up in January, then they'll go ahead and do whatever they'll have done without having had our our input. If we want to give them any input, right. okay. Correct. So I, I I think I think it's sort of speak now or forever hold our peace. And, Departmental and, comment is optional, but they do make referrals okay. when they have pending legislation. Right. So uh, I, I was asking that rather, if it were dead, then there's no sense in taking time to do anything. But if, since it may come up, and I, I think we ought to, I, I have a few observations okay. then in regard to it that I'd like to put on the record. And that is that in regard to, with all due respect to the consultants, and uh, I'm sure that you're totally above board and honest in everything that you do, there is indeed a history in San Francisco of scandals relating to permit expediters. There's allegations relating to uh, that at times that have come up over the years, as I've seen, having to do with uh, uh, charges of political corruption relating to expediters, whatever that is, as opposed to what you're doing. Uh, maybe it's the same thing in terms of getting permits and that much of the process itself in regard to the permit, getting of the permits was somewhat opaque because people who were involved in expediting permits were doing things behind the scenes and also that they were involved with political figures in San Francisco, like members of the Board of Supervisors. So there was this overtone of possible corruption that was a, seen as a, either a problem or a potential problem. Now, whether that's true or not, I, I think that it is, imp I can't see any, any real downside to, in terms of anything that you've said as to why 
it's going to be so burdensome or onerous or terrible for a permit consultant to tell the people of San Francisco in regard to the issuance of permits, which are very controversial and very, uh, very much uh, in uh, uh, the public is concerned about how much is being paid them as a fee. I, I really don't see how that puts any real terrible unfairness or strain on people. Uh, I, with all due respects, having listened to your comments and all that. And at the same time, I think it, it is an opening for lack of transparency within the process to the general public to have permits issued and have these, these kinds of activities going on in the background and to not have that information. I think that's good. It's good public policy for that information to be out there, uh, to be seen. So my own uh, suggestion would be, that, as a commission, that we uh, ask Supervisor Chu to not delete the requirement that the consultants reveal their fees, because I think it's beneficial as a matter of policy, and, and I, I really don't see any big problem that you guys have, uh, would have with it on, on, on any real level. Other comments from the commissioners? Well, I think I would <laughs> join in, in uh, the comments that uh, Commissioner Keene has made about the purpose of this legislation and the uh, reason why the provision about the fees be included. And when you say this becomes onerous, well, I look at all the things that you have to report, and I don't know why reporting your fees is the onerous one. Uh, I, I, I could see maybe some argument about all the other ones, but I think uh, from a public perception point of view, uh, it, it, I, I'm in favor of more transparency, and fees are very important for the citizens to believe that uh, there isn't some back-channel remuneration going on here. I am sensitive to the concern that disclosing what you're getting paid for a specific um, client is sensitive information that may cause your competitors, particularly large competitors, to undercut you. If you're a small business and, and, and your large competitors see that, hey, we can get this business too, we can, we can charge it for a little bit less, we can absorb the loss, and, and these guys are, are, are out of work. So, that, so that, that's the thing that gives me pause. I, I'm, I'm cognizant and also concerned about the transparency given the history of, of um, permit consultants as well. I wonder whether there is some middle ground, you know, wh whether um, we require it for those who make over 100000 um, It We maybe disclose what the median, the first quartile, third quartile, and median is without associating names with them so that the public knows how much these folks are making. Uh, some, something to that effect that, that doesn't necessarily, um, you know, jeopardize their, their business while also giving the public some sense of what these permit consultants are, are, are making. Because, and, and who knows, if it turns out to be a, a big problem and we see the average permit expediter makes, I, I won't even put a number on it, but some number that is appalling to the public and, and, and you know, then, then maybe we we revisit, but I'm not sure there's a, it's not clear to me that there is, uh, that, that the, the privacy concerns over, overcome the, um, or are overcome by uh, the concerns about corruption um, in this instance. Yeah, I tend to um, lean a little more towards uh, uh, Commissioner Hur's position in the fact that I don't know how competitive the marketplace is. It, it, you know, uh, rationale would have it that it, the more competitive 
um, um, the marketplace is, you can only do so much with your fees, or else you're just going to, you know, you'll you'll end up, you know, uh, undercutting yourself by just not being competitive in the marketplace. The other piece of that would be uh, if it's if it's not competitive in the marketplace and it's kind of a and, and it's kind of a, a, a open season. Uh, then a, an, an, an assumption can be made that the larger the fee is, the possibly you can make a connection between that large fee and, and something being expedited in a way that might not otherwise happen. So uh, I, I think there are there's kind of like the general business uh, principles that would apply here. That in the marketplace, I'm, I'm quite interested. I don't I, I don't know if we can hear from them, but I'm not really sure that the fees are ultimately, if indeed there is any kind of corruption that exists, would be the driver of it as much as they are the connections that possibly people have or other uh, nefarious things that possibly could be going on or nepotism or whatever that happens to be. It, it seems like the marketplace would take care of that, that the competitiveness of the marketplace would take care of it in terms of the fees. So I, I, uh, I, I respect the fact that these are... Um, private businesses that are being um, run and that they're uh, uh, needing to be competitive. And, and if the marketplace is also incredibly wide, which you have small ma and pa's on one side and you have incredibly large companies on the other side, who will do that? I mean, we, we see that all the time in, you know, in, in architectural firms, right, who can take the small – the recession hit and all of a sudden the big firms are taking all, any project they can get and then the poor ma and pa's can never be competitive in that regard because there was just an economy of scale that they could bring to bear. So I, I think we need to be careful as we move forward not to uh, step too far into – you know, the just general business practices and, and what, frankly, I feel that um, uh, business and the market, the competitive marketplace could take care of itself and that we wouldn't make some kind of implicit or implicit assumption that that's where uh, uh, the birthplace of potential corruption lives. It could potentially, but I feel it probably comes from other areas as well, and I'm not sure you solve that by just... Uh, making transparent the fees. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm reading the the section that is involved, the C1, but it does not appear that what's needed to be reported is the fee for each job. It's a quarterly report with which you have to identify all your con all the projects or employers. It says the name, business address so-and-so, number of each person from whom the permit consultant or permit consultant's employer received or expect to receive economic consideration for payment and the amount of economic consideration the permit consultant received or expected to receive. I don't know whether that is what they, all they have to report is a figure for the quarter, combined amount of what their fees were, or whether they have to, which clearly would not be give some, some competitive information on a specific job, uh, but I don't know what the staff's view is to what that section requires. Jesse Minority, Deputy Executive Director. Um, you know, we had, uh, frankly, when we read it, we interpreted it to mean that you know you name the each client, and then with respect to each client, you name the amount that was paid per quarter. So uh, to the extent there were multiple jobs, let's say, or permits that were um, uh, obtained or pursued, there would be a lump sum with respect to all those permits. But if there was one permit, then you would essentially be getting right. the full amount. Yeah. So I, I would agree with that interpretation. It does seem to depend on the factual scenario at hand. I also want to clarify for the benefit of the commission if it would be helpful for your discussion. I think you can ask follow-up questions. Uh, the persons that did show up at okay. public comment today. Sure. That's good. Uh, That's certainly, I, I, Thank you. I think you should try to take advantage sure. of that. I just wanted to make sure we got yeah. the reviews of the commissioners. Well, since we can do that, I'd like to solicit your response to what we've been raising. Thank you very much, Commissioner Keene. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, it's, it's important to understand that 
we work in an environment that there are many other names on business cards identifying the, the, the field of work of the people who are doing the same exact thing who will not be subject to these requirements um, or who have expressed that they don't believe they will be subject to these requirements or being protected by their own uh, standing under the business and professions code under the state. So you'll have attorneys that do this, you'll have architects who do this, you'll have general contractors that do this. And you will find that if there is protection from disclosure of um, fees that are uh, available to people within those professions, that there are certain types of clients that will naturally prefer that they work through professionals who do not de need to disclose the fees that they are being charged. Um, so you will see a lot of the work that I do uh, for s smaller businesses are going to be drifting downtown to the larger land use law firms that handle this kind of thing. And I think that's an unfortunate loss because I think I bring something very different to serving my clients than they do, um, in, including um, more attention to their real needs uh, and the actual code issues and the way they're implemented in, in the community. Um, I think that the, what, the, the transparency issue about um, how things are done at City Hall uh, uh, in, in the permitting matters, in, in, in der deriving entitlements, is, as one of my colleagues stated, it's all there on the computers and on the databases and the documentations because it's irrefutable who has signed for city planning and who has signed for the Department of Building Inspection and Public Works and the de Fire Department. There, there's never any vagueness or shadowiness to actually where the approval came from. So if there's ever any question as to the way that approval was derived, it's very easy to determine who the, what the critical path was. So the transparency is really there. And the scale of projects that might lack that are way beyond the uh, bailiwick of people who identify themselves as permit consultants anyway. Those are the things that are going to be handled entirely by the largest downtown law firms and by the large construction firms that do a lot, great deal of permit work under the guise of their construction work. So I, I, I hope they've, I've been clear in, in answering some of those questions. Commissioner Andrews, did you have other questions? Sir? So I, I do hope that you'll consider the impact on uh, the smallest businesses in town. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Patterson? I just do wish we had had uh, someone here from the Friends of Ethics who had uh, given their concerns to us <coughs> in, a, in a memo, but it would be nice to if they had shown up and weighed in on this. I, I would have found it helpful. Do we have a definition of permit consultants? Uh, because I know lawyers for a long time said they weren't lobbyists, but uh, that's changed. Uh, and uh, so is there a definition of permit consultants? Jesse Minardi, Deputy Executive Director. There is a definition, and I'd say uh, um, I can read it for you. Uh, it's an individual who receives or is promised compensation to provide permit consulting services, which is defined uh, to commence on or after January 1, 2015, on a major project or a minor project, both defined terms. This includes any employee who receives compensation attributable to time spent on these permit consulting services. And then it does uh, include three uh, exemptions. One uh, is the licensed architect or engineer of record for the construction activity, as well as employees of that architect and engineer. Um, the main contractor responsible for all construction activities. And uh, to this point, staff is, there, there's not a reference to an employee of the contractor, although staff is inclined to interpret that to mean an employee of the main contractor and then an employee or agent um, of a tax exempt 501c3 organization communicating on behalf of that organization 
regarding development of a uh, project for that organization. And I would just uh, say in closing, I think staff is inclined to uh, interpret the term permit consultant um, in a, the similar fashion as a lobbyist. So um, it's, uh, you know, it can be a difficult line to draw, but to the extent there's something that's uh, the practice of law, i.e. a layperson would be not permitted to do that, um, that would not be permit consulting, but to the extent it's an activity that somebody without a law degree could, uh, or a, a member of the bar could uh, participate, um, that would be permit consulting activity that's disclosable. So now that we have, under the umbrella of lobbying, someone who is a lawyer who engages in lobby activities is held to the standards that we put upon lobbyists, the argument that was made that, well, you got someone from a big law firm who's doing these permit consultants, consultancies, they're not going to have to disclose that. that. That wouldn't really be true here, would it? Well, and I, I would say you're correct. It's not true. Okay. Um, there's not an express exemption like there is under the lobbying ordinance, but I think we would agree with what you said. I mean, as a practical matter, though, is a lawyer who is – Occasionally bringing permits to City Hall or wherever they they go, uh, going to re disclose what their clients are paying them fees under the attorney client. I mean, I, I guess I'm not optimistic that unless they're doing it as a large part of their business, that information is going to get disclosed. I think they'd have to if it's if it's if the ordinance requires it, just as. The lobbying ordinances now don't allow someone to say, no, I'm not a lobbyist, I'm a lawyer, and I'm doing all this stuff, I'm meeting with these supervisors, I'm doing all this other stuff, I'm, but, but I'm a lawyer, therefore it's, it's legal stuff. Since that's no longer going to fly, then in terms of the same thing uh, would, would, would occur with someone who's a lawyer who's doing permit consultancies. And if... If I were a lawyer doing permanent consultancies, I wouldn't risk uh, not apply, uh, complying with this statute. Uh, I, I don't see any attorney-client problem there, not, no, not when you get down to fees, at disclosure of fees. I think it's a close call. I mean, you raise a good point, though. I mean, if a, if a lobbyist lawyer lobbyist is a lobbyist, then that lawyer has to register, and, and the permit consultant would, would as well. Um, I, uh, Mr. Patterson, I have a couple of questions for you. What is the, the range of fees we're talking about here? In, in other words, and I don't want any specific information about any specific client of yours, but, I, I mean, on a million-dollar project, what is a, an average fee? for these permit consultants? There are several different ways, and I, I should clarify, these are not my clients necessarily. I, I don't think there's that kind of money involved, to be honest. Um, there are different ways that permit Meaning consultants. Meaning they couldn't afford you? Well, <laughs> I'm not from one of the named uh, or unnamed big downtown law firms, uh, but still, it, it, yeah. Uh, there are different ways that permit consultants charge fees. Uh, some charge by the hour for their time that they invest in, in a project. Uh, some have a contingency fee, so if a permit is ultimately issued uh, that they help carry the papers around for, then they'll take a fee. Um, and those fees range a great deal, depending, I think, mostly on whether it's a contingency agreement or not and what expertise <laughs> the particular consultant has. So some consultants are, say, structural engineers or architects. Uh, some don't have those types of uh, advanced degrees. And I, I just wonder when the public sees, or if the public sees, uh, a certain set of fees disclosed, it's going to be a number without an explanation. And sometimes that number will be higher than others, but the public is not going to be able to attribute a higher number to corruption when in most cases it's a higher number because this person has um, either an advanced degree that's being used to uh, provide additional uh, advice. Patterson, to with all due respect, mm -hmm. can you answer my question? Oh, sure. Um, I, 
I would have to defer for specific amounts of money to the consultants themselves. So you don't know what the range is on a million dollar project? I, I, I think it would be best coming from a consultant. Thank you, uh, Commissioner President Her. Um, the in a million dollar project, a, a typical new single family home of, of fairly typical proportions, in, modest proportions I might even say in San Francisco, would be identified as a million dollar project. In the course of a uh, expediting the approvals for uh, permits for a million dollar uh, new single family home, uh, you might f I might find my billing run be running between five and ten thousand dollars over the course of that project. We're not looking at um, a, an enormous amount of work based on uh, the actual valuation. The valuation isn't really pertinent to it. So is it, I mean, but is it commensurate typically with, with the amount at stake? I mean, is a two million, I would, do I would you say, typically charge more for a $2 million house? I would say typically not. Um, there are s some people in the community who may do that. Um, I tend to do it based on the complexity and, and difficulty of the project. If I got, uh, you know, a, a serious active group of neighbors, it's going to cost more. Mm -hmm. Which Thank you'll you. always have in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in some neighbors, even more so than others. What does the commission think about a recommendation with a some sort of uh, minimum? So, in other words, if you if you were paid more than seventy five thousand dollars in a quarter, then you disclose or. 300,000 in a year, something to that effect. I mean, it does strike me that if you're, I mean, if you're making five or $10,000, you know, a few, a few clients a quarter, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that the, the corruption element uh, really comes into play. And I, I still am sensitive to um, some of the concerns with disclosure. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of sort of struck with it still with just a to what end because because I think a, you're going to find um, the reporting all over the place um, not both within the individual who is or the entity that is reporting quarter over quarter and then you're not going to I'm not sure how you apply any kind of rationale across all of them S some people are are more active and engaged in wanting to make more money. Some are just happy to do it because they're semi-retired and they only want a certain amount of money. I'm, I'm, I'm just a little, there are too many for me X factors. And I'm, I'm nervous that without some amount of guidance or some context that can be kind of uniformly applied to it, um, uh, that the public can be, that, that can help guide the public as they read it. Once it's, trans once it's transparent, you kind of sort of don't want people reading through all of these documents and finding all of these uh, uh, amounts of money and then coming to their own conclusions on it. I mean, you, you may be looking for something that just frankly is not there. I don't know. It just feels, it feels to me that I, I haven't really truly gotten to the what end piece uh, outside of the, the big rubric of transparency. Did you, you know, the universal law of order and chaos, you've created order in the fact that you've gotten people to report their numbers. What amount of chaos have you created by the fact that now that they're reporting, a, a bunch of people are public who deserves to know things, are we giving them just enough information to be dangerous? Or are we doing a disservice by doing this as well? So there's the business aspects of it, but then there's this kind of these unintended uh, uh, unintended components of it as well. So I struggle. Commissioner, Commissioner yeah, in response to your suggestion, Commissioner, my, my overall desire would be to just say you have to reveal it all. But I also get the sense of my colleagues in terms of uh, trying to reach some sort of consensus here. And I think it would be a mistake for us to not come out with something which tells the Board of Supervisors that we feel there's a problem here and, and that they should have something like a floor, at least, that, that you're suggesting or a ceiling. So I, I would uh, solicit, if I could, the Chair to 
suggest a figure, and I'm, I'm perfectly willing to put that in the form of a motion uh, to the uh, to the board that they uh, require the disclosure of uh, the fees in anything over X, whatever 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 the chair feels comfortable with. Just so we can come out with something. Otherwise, sure. we're, we're not going to have Yeah. Uh, uh, Commissioner Andrews? So I only to put this out there as well. Um, I guess okay to put out a number, but again, it, for me, I don't know if people make $35,000 a year or if they make $350,000 a year, in which case in any quarter uh, you could put out a number of you, you disclose everything over $75,000, and then it turns out you hit you hit 90% of people or you hit no one or you hit no one at all. I feel like we don't have an, enough information about really the range of what people are making on an annual basis or quarterly basis to figure out what that number could be and then when they reach that number, if, the, if there is a trigger, would, this would be this, this trigger number, what do you do with it once they reach it? Is there some amount of investigation that is going to happen after that? Like, I'm. I, I don't know. I mean, what, what does after you've reached that threshold and you report, is there some is there an is there an action from some enforcement body that is going to look into it? Two dollars over it, and then you have to report it. Mr. Shen. Yeah. So if I could just add one uh, suggestion to this discussion, um, I would definitely defer to the executive director on this. But I don't think the commission necessarily needs to have a number in whatever feedback it wishes to provide the board of supervisors. I think simply recommending. And again, I defer to the director on this, but recommending that the board consider some sort of monetary threshold for the reporting of fees and simply leave it at that. Because I, I certainly understand that in this relatively limited amount of time that we have to discuss this matter, you may just not have all the information before you. And so even something like that, I think, would provide some potential guidance to the board of supervisors down the road. I'd like to put that in the form of a motion. Uh, Anything else from the commissioners before Commissioner Keene does so? Okay. I move that we recommend to the Board of Supervisors <coughs> that uh, they require some sort of monetary threshold at which the uh, permit uh, consultants much, must disclose the amount of their fees. Is there a second? I will second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. Commissioner Rennie, did you I, vote? I said aye. You said aye, okay. Uh, so the uh, motion passes three to one. We will recommend to the uh, board that they consider a threshold uh, over which the permit consultant would have to disclose fees as indicated in the legislation. Steve, let me ask a question and maybe, and that is that are we recommending that they not delete this provision, but that they amend it to set a threshold to where it comes into place? That, that's ambiguous in a sense is what we did. I, I think your language is more accurate. Yes. I think that's, that's what we're, that's what we'd be recommending. Maybe uh, I will make a supplemental motion, if I might, that uh, we advise the Board of Supervisors that we are opposed to their deleting in its entirety the requirement of a financial disclosure, but that they consider a possible floor below which it's not necessary to report. Okay, I, I would not agree to that amendment. I think, I, I, and I know it's, it sounds very similar, but to me, I, I think a floor is important. If we don't have a floor, I would not be in favor of, um, uh, I would be in favor of removing the provision entirely. In other words, my preference is a floor. If there's no floor, I don't think we want this in there for the reasons I stated before. So I would, we can still vote on it, yeah, but, it, I, I'll have but I'm not going to second it. That's my yeah. motion. Right. Um, I think that in light of the way I count here, uh, 
I, I would prefer not to accept that then as, as, if, as if it's a supplement to my motion. So, and just, just leave it the way we have voted on, on it. The motion that we, ha we have voted on. Because my, otherwise my, we're my not- My supplement of motion didn't get seconded, so. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's the end of it. We wouldn't have had the votes for it anyway, Paul, no. so. <laughs> I, I'd love to have gone with it. <laughs> Uh, just to clarify, as a matter of procedure, Pro Commissioner Rennie, do you want to rescind your prior vote on the on the? No, okay. Okay, so that uh, Commissioner Rennie's motion. <coughs> I'm sorry, Commissioner Keene's motion passes three to one. Thank you to all yeah. who came, and I appreciate second. your comments. No second. I think no second. Yeah. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, discussion and possible action regarding. Policies relating to the Sunshine Ordinance. Could someone go down the hall and let them know? I think they're here. The two of them here. Oh, I didn't see them come in. Sorry. Commissioners, are you guys? Can we take a break for a hour? Uh, we're going to take just a, a few minute break uh, and then resume in five minutes. Okay, we are now back in session. Uh, let me thank the folks in the audience who have uh, stayed. Uh, again, apologies for the delay in our, our getting started. Um, the next item on the agenda is discussion and possible action relating to our policies for Sunshine Ordinance Task Referrals. Uh, Mr. Minardi, are you going to be introducing this one? Thank you, yes. Thank you. Um, Jesse Minardi, Deputy Executive Director. Thank you, Chair Herr. Um, I'll take just a few minutes to introduce this and then defer to you as to how you'd like the uh, conversation to go. But this uh, item in this project was really a result of staff sense um, from, uh, of, of both the commissions and staff's frustration with um, a, a lot of the referrals um, that have come in the past, uh, certainly at a minimum eight months from the Sunshine Ordinance Task Force, where there have been issues uh, as to uh, procedure that sometimes have uh, prevented uh, the commission and staff from getting to the, the real meat and potatoes, the substance of the matter uh, that was before us. So this was an attempt by staff to identify some of those issues um, uh, and, uh, and begin a discussion with the commissioners and hopefully uh, get uh, a, a consensus and direction from the commissioners as to how they would like to proceed uh, going forward so that we um, can um, apply um, uh, clear uh, procedures and guidelines to the referrals that come to us and also that the task force can be aware, the uh, Sunshine Ordinance Task Force can be aware of those policies and procedures so that they can then act accordingly and tailor their actions so that they know that if they do things a particular way, we will get to, uh, like I said, the substance of the issues. And so um, we uh, drafted this memo actually a while ago and um, we're um, uh, able to distribute it both to the members of the task force as well as uh, department heads. Um, and uh, the task force has been, uh, has uh, given us feedback both uh, orally uh, and in writing and there are two members uh, here today who uh, are um, going to speak to you. And so uh, just very briefly, the, you know, the, the general issues, which I think you, you, you maybe um, all have been already familiar with, are sort of uh, referrals that we receive where there seems to be some inconsistency between either the complaint or the order of determination made by the task force and then ultimately the referral that um, uh, gets to us and the underlying concern obviously that, uh, that uh, I think everyone would have is that um, people who at the task force level uh, should have the opportunity to sort of answer uh, allegations and that if it then comes to us, we want to sort of have uh, um, assurances that that uh, sort of fairness was uh, uh, accorded to them. Um, and to the extent there are discrepancies um, uh, in, in likelihood, you know, many times inadvertent, uh, how, do we, how do we handle that? Um, the second one is um, uh, department head responsibility for uh, uh, apparent violations of the ordinance and to what extent is the department head responsible for actions by his or her staff. And then the third is sort of uh, 
a little bit of a separate issue, but somewhat related, which is during the course of the Sunshine Task Force uh, proceedings, um, there will be, you know, requests for an authorized representative to come and explain why records weren't produced, uh, certain procedures weren't followed, et cetera. And what does it mean to comply with that requirement under the Sunshine Ordinance? Uh, for an authorized representative. So we tried to give uh, a little context and kind of, uh, you know, summarize where the commission has been since it uh, enacted its uh, uh, regulations for handling these matters. And um, with that, I'll give it over to you, Chair. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Nardi. Uh, I'd like to just say at the outset that I thought the staff memo was very well done and that I also appreciated the memo from uh, Ms. Washburn. Um, who uh, responded to many of the, the options and comments in the staff memo. Um, and and it, it appears also for Mr. Mr. Hepner. Yes, thank, thank you both very much. I thought your memo was, was very helpful as well. Um, I, I think it would be most helpful if we had um, either Mr. Hep, Hep, Hepner or I believe it's Dr. Wash, it's Dr. Washburn, Dr. Washburn, uh, up at the podium, and then we could each kind of ask questions to to to, uh, to you all, and um, maybe take it issue by issue, and then take public comment at the end. Is that acceptable to the to the commission? Okay. If I may? Yes. Um, I just wanted to say we greatly appreciate this opportunity, and we have um, had several meetings with regard to these issues, and um, certainly appreciate your challenges. Um, this is my seventh year on the task force, and so I've seen uh, a lot of things over the past seven years, and I was part of the uh, group that helped fashion the, the regulations that you're following with regard to our referrals. Um, and I'd like to actually, uh, um, member, uh, Mr. Hepner uh, was the one who, um, using his legal expertise, actually drafted the memo, uh, which I reviewed and approved. So um, I'd like for him to, um, for you to direct your specific questions to him, although I'm very familiar with with the content, um, I'm here to, as I, I as I told Lee, to provide color and institutional history. Um, I think I can answer questions with regard to why perhaps we do the things the way we do them, and perhaps cite some instances um, about how we how we operate. Thank you. Thanks to you both. So I'd like to start with issue one, and the. Staff appears to be recommending option four of, uh, as a way of handling instances where the task force referral letter um, is inconsistent with orders or resolutions in the same matter. Uh, and uh, Mr. Minardi, I would gather that you've read um, the, the task force memo as well. Um, what is your and they recommend option three so what is your response to that and, and, and does that affect the staff's view on whether to go with option three or four <clears throat> um, well I just say as a as a first that um, uh, the, the, these the, these issues are, are related too, so it's it's helpful to, and I forgot to mention this before, but it's helpful to think of these in the context of each other. Um, and certainly, I appreciate what the the, the task force uh, has suggested here. Um, I think the reason why we would prefer option four, and um, and again, uh, you know, there's not going to be. <laughs> we might not all agree 100% with the with the with the direction that the that the, ta the commission takes in this regard. But I think taking a position in and of itself is is beneficial. So let me just say that. Um, but I think what we're trying to get at with option four is that you know in in chapter two matters, you know, we have our chapter three matters where essentially the the commission sort of redoes kind of everything that the um, 
that the uh, task force does, um, and those are for willful violations. And with the Chapter 2 matters, we sort of say, okay, well, we're going to kind of basically rely uh, on what the, um, what the task force did. And I think the concern is that in instances where, you know, perhaps it's unclear that somebody got um, notice, let's say, or that um, they had the opportunity to respond to a particular violation alleged that uh, sort of deferring to the task force in that way might ne not necessarily be fair, for lack of a better, better word. Um, and so, you know, that's why, you know, we put as a potential option that, well, you know, in, in most cases, if, if, if the task force sort of, it seems like folks have notice, they had an opportunity to respond, we say, okay, well, we'll then we'll take that. Um, and in Chapter 2 matters, we'll, we'll um, defer to your decision. Whereas uh, it, if it doesn't look like, just from the record, for whatever reason, again, in most cases likely inadvertent, that folks didn't have the opportunity to respond, we would say, okay, well, we're, gonna, we're not going to, the burden will not be on you. Um, it will be on um, the complainant in that instance. That's, that's the sort of the rationale, I guess. Okay, maybe I'll ask Mr. Hepner for your response to that and then open it up for commissioners to ask either of you questions. Right, and um, thanks again for the opportunity. I, I think that uh, issue number one really gets to um, the core of understanding how the Sunshine Task Force operates and the, and the lifespan of a complaint through a referral to the Ethics Com Commission. Um, we start with a complaint from um, a, you know, a citizen complainant to our task force uh, with specific allegations um, that in not every instance is as sophisticated or is as fleshed out as um, uh, it becomes over the course of our consideration of the facts. Um, but at, at each phase, when we're, when we're doing our fact-finding in inquiry, we provide notice to um, the individuals that we deem responsible. And I guess what I'm getting at by that is by saying, by the time that it's a referral to the Ethics Commission, there is not a conceivable instance where an individual would not have received notice and an opportunity to be heard before some body, before some determinator, before some fact finder of the task force um, prior to it being referred here. Um, it's just not, it, it's not conceivable. Um, it, the things, the, the matters come before the full task force first. Um, uh, they tend, in my experience, and granted this is my first year with the task force, but I'm, I'm attempting to learn quickly, they get referred to commission shortly thereafter, whether it's the Compliance and Amendments Commission, our Education Committee, excuse me, um, our Education and Outreach Committee. Um, that committee does not make a determination as to whether a willful violation has been found. It gets referred back to the task force again and then and for, for determination as to whether a willful violation has been found. Um, uh, if it is going to take that very, tr that's the traditional route of these complaints, at each phase we can provide, we can new notice, additional notice to, to respondents in these matters. And that includes um, uh, individuals who we have deemed um, responsible for the violation in question, whether that's a custodian of records, it's not always the department head, but the individual who was directly involved with responding to the request, and to the extent that it is a department head, that, that person, if we believe that they have either ratified um, uh, or approved, or otherwise approved, or were di directly involved the public records request, that individual will receive notice before determination that um, a, a, ref a referral to ethics is warranted. So that's why I think that um, in, in all instances, the Ethics Commission would be wise to defer to the determination of the Sunshine Task Force, um, whether it's a Chapter 2 or a Chapter 3 proceeding. If it turns on whether an individual has received notice, um, I, I think that it has to be um, assumed that that individual has. And um, short of being assumed, uh, we should be making it very clear in our referrals to the Ethics Commission that that individual has received notice and an opportunity to respond. And, and to that extent, it's on us to provide that information. Questions or, or comments for either Mr. Hapner or Mr. Minardi? Mr. Just, uh, Mr. Hapner, uh, following up on what you just said, you, I think you've covered, you may have covered the concern, but one of the things that our staff has um, uh, recommended in a footnote at page 6, uh, footnote 10, 
that I looked at and I said, boy, that would sure would have helped me in regard to uh, a couple of the things that we've had before us where we didn't know whether they had the issues, these were the issues that they discussed, and uh, or these were the parties. Uh, the, our staff recommended that instead of ruling on issues that were not adequately noticed, the task force might be better served by instituting a procedure for an initial review of all complaints in order to identify the appropriate issues and parties. As I just listened to you, I seem to get from you that you already have that. I, I think that's fair, uh, and, and yes, uh, uh, we do perform. I mean, the our complaints are considered at numerous stages, um, and I think it's it's fair to say that that first the, at the first instance when it comes before the task force, that is that preliminary <laughs> review before it gets referred to committee, um, and then referred back to the task force for a potential willful violation. Member Washburn. Well, prior prior to the complaint appearing before the um, full task force, our administrator attempts to do some mediation. So some some cases go away at that point. Uh, we've recently, and for the past number of years, um, it's true that the first time there's a <laughs> full hearing on the merits, which will include really trying to identify, well, what are the real issues here? Because many of our complainants, you know, have no idea how to, you know, how to even, you know, craft their complaint in a way that we can understand. So it's a lot of work that has to be done, and we've been doing that work in the full task force. Um, but recently, we've um, we had a case tonight. We we've reconstituted the complaint process that we had in place for a number of years, where we would bring the parties in to try to first of all determine whether there was we had jurisdiction to hear the case, and then secondly to try to identify the real issues at hand. And because of our um, workload, we weren't doing that for a while. Um, we also were short a few members, so it was a, a, a member, a, a matter of just having the staff, or the members to do it. But we've since uh, reconstituted the complaint process. So tonight, for example, the Compliance and Amendments Committee that um, Member Hepner and I are, are serve on, he's chair of this committee, we heard a complaint where for the first time where we were trying to figure out, well, what are the real issues here? And um, so that will be, re we made a recommendation to the full task force. And we're not sure how this is going to work, but we're hoping that when the full task force hears it, the issues will be clear, the, um, the, the proper respondent will be named. Um, you know, that's how we'd like to see this work. We're, but we also have realize that we have some complainants who are not going to go for having their matter heard in a committee, so they will demand a full task force hearing. But at any rate, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing process to try to figure out, well, what, what, are the, what happened? What are the issues? Um, who, who do we name? And that often isn't clear until, until the full task force hears it, and we have question and answer over a long hearing which actually brings up the, the third issue about having somebody appear before us who can answer our questions. So, yeah, these issues are all interrelated. Could I then just follow up with sure. a question to Mr. Menard? Then that in regard to what we've just heard, and I, I read your recommendation and I said, boy, that's spot on in terms of the problems that we've had. Are the concerns now taken care of by what we've uh, heard from the, uh, the commission as to what their manner is in regard to identifying the issues and parties? Or, or, do, we need, or do you think we need some more? Uh, thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I think that we're on the same page in, in many respects, meaning I think that with the process works the way it's described, I think that we, you know, that, that second part of option four doesn't become necessary because I think we will understand that everybody will get notice 
and the opportunity to kind of say their piece about every allegation that comes to us. The, the, I mean, I guess the concern I still have is that, you know, an again, and I think it's inadvertent, an inadvertent omission as to a particular person getting notice or as to a particular um, violation, a, a person being noticed about a particular violation, if that happens, let's say inadvertently, we're still sort of in the same situation where we're like, oh, well, they didn't have the opportunity to kind of give their side at the, uh, at the task force. So um, again, yeah. I mean, I think we're, we're mostly there. We're just concerned about that small percentage, which unfortunately we've had to deal with the past couple of times where it's not clear that the per people knew that they were, uh, ha you know, had the obligation to respond to particular allegations. What if we were to modify option three to say that we'll adopt option three um, if you add at the end, if the referral letter indicates that the uh, respondent was given notice of all of the, uh, what, it's, I don't, it's not causes of action, but all of the, um, is it causes of action? All allegations. Alle of all of the allegations. Uh, that were made against him or her and, and had the opportunity to respond. Because if the task force represents that to us, then I think we can treat it, like d depending on which chapter it is, in the, with the proper deference. And then the respondent can, can come, come in and say, actually, you know, that's, that's right, but, or no, that didn't happen, and we can consider. Sure, yeah. I, I I think that that's fine, and it it was the comment that I was going to provide before, right before you said that was as long as we on our end uh, have a requirement that we provide um, uh, that we uh, include what notice was provided on what date to whom and of what what you know then if that's in our referral letter then it obviates you know any confusion on the issue. I think that's right. Actually, um, something new we've started doing, our administrator has developed a uh, complaint history form where we're going to be tracking matters like this so that um, when we refer a matter to you, and not, not just for that reason, for our own institutional history, and our, we, we sometimes see the same sorts of cases right. over and over, so we're attempting to build a what will amount to a database, but there will be for each complaint a history that will have that kind of information, and that will help us make sure that we um, provide proper notice. Um, okay. Any other comments or questions on this issue? Uh, public comment on issue one? It's Diana Christensen. I'm the custodian of records for the Human Services Agency. I've um, been in that capacity for the last two years uh, where I've responded on behalf of the Human Services Agency to Sunshine um, issues. We have filled 125 Sunshine requests this year, um, in part because it's being used as a way to stop a proposed uh, shelter in the Bayview Hunters Point area that we're trying to build for homeless people. Um, so we get a lot of complaints and, uh, and it's not always clear. I think my, my frustration with the task force's process is it's not always clear by the complainant what they're complaining about. Um, complaints have gone forward initially with as little information to the Human Services Agency as um, they failed to, they grievously failed to uh, fill our request, but without a explana clear explanation as to how, um, and certainly not who did it. Um, and that, that information changes over the course of the testimony that goes to, um, to the, the task force. Um, the allegations seem to change, the findings seem to change, and, it, and it's unclear. At one point, we had a quality assurance um, person in our department named by the complainant, and I tried for months to get that person off of the complaint because they were not the responsible party, and it didn't happen. Now, that complaint was never sustained, but we went through 
hearing after hearing on it ha went back several times. Um, and that person was fearful and, um, and I don't know if you know, if you're not typically in front of these task forces, it's hard to um, go forward and think you're being accused of something when, when in fact you didn't have the responsibility for it. Um, so I can tell you that it, it feels amorphous to me, that it's not clear what the allegations are always, it's not clear um, who they're against, um, and, uh, and it changes at the very end. Um, and, you know, having spent part of my, I spent part of my career 10 years at the Office of Citizen Complaints, handling complaints. Um, and it was very clear, very up, up front when the initial work was done, what the allegations were, and there was always a finding on it, even if it was unfounded, um, so that you would know exactly what happened with that complaint. And that's not happening here. Thank you. Uh, any other public comment on this matter? Any other comments from the commissioners? Uh, is there a motion to adopt option three as amended? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that motion passes. Let's move to issue two. And it appears for issue two that the task force and the staff agree that we should adopt options three and four. Chair sure, Her. Is that I, right? Have I misstated it? I think the task force, um, I don't think that they were the the option four was um, added after the draft was circulated, so okay. um, I think they agreed on option three, and I'm sorry I forget if. Uh, let's see. Option option four is the one where you, where you can uh, uh, bring a complaint against a city department for right. a non willful violation, and that's the one that. The task force was not able to weigh in on because the memo that they had did not right. include that option. Okay. So maybe we can start by having Mr. Hepner or Dr. Washburn address option four. Not to put you right. on the spot. No, that's fine. <laughs> I mean, this is my first time seeing it, and I and I can uh, tell you what my personal immediate reaction is, and Chair Washburn can disagree um, or agree as appropriate. Um, my only issue, um, well, my I'd say my primary issue right now with option four is that finding a violation against the city department, um, while it may assist in building a record, does little to uh, encourage any accountability. Um, and I, I think that... Um, often when there's a failure to adhere to open government or, or transparency laws or ordinances, you need an accountable party. You need an accountable person. Somebody's going um, to uh, respond to um, uh, uh, the finding of a violation against them. So I, I'm not sure what good a non-wilful violation against the city department does. Um, I, I would hope, and in fact, I'll be clear that um, our response to this issue two was that all options one, two, and three um, uh, were meritorious under different circumstances, under various circumstances. Um, uh, but each of those address a violation being found against an individual, an indiv you know, somebody who can be held accountable, um, and pr provided that we proceed with our notice obligation uh, as is addressed by issue one, um, I, I think that, that those are appropriate options. Um. Um, I, I think it's pretty impossible for the task force to weigh in formally on this, not, not having had a chance to discuss it amongst all of us. Um, my initial reaction was, though, that seems reasonable. Um, I guess based on my experience over the years when I can think of cases where there was a clear violation, um, but we could not 
come up with anybody to hold responsible for it. We, you know, that something was awry at the department or the agency, um, probably due to uh, just lack of training or having policies in place or, um, you know, way back when, when we were all just getting to know the ordinance, um, you know, just being unfamiliar. And, some, and, and let's face it, there are parts of it that are ambiguous and need clarification uh, through amendments. So I, I think I can think of, I can't think of a specific case right now, but I know that over the years we've been hard pressed to name a person. And, you know, we would think, well, we ought to name the department head, although we understood in this, you know, the particular case that that person wasn't directly responsible in any way that you would want to, you know, have it in their personnel record or whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm inclined to see where that could be useful at times, too. But, uh, you know, all four options seem, under different scenarios, seem to make sense because <coughs> it's remarkable how many different wrinkles uh, we can find in the cases. And on second thought, I mean, to the extent that it allows the Ethics Commission to have a little bit more faith in finding a violation against um, a department as opposed to a department head that was not named, um, then maybe it is appropriate where we, um, by virtue of not knowing what individual was directly responsible, only refer a, de a department to you. Uh, I think that in most circumstances, we would prefer to refer an individual or responsible party. Um, but if not, then maybe that's, that speaks for itself, and the Ethics Commission be, can, can be comfortable finding a violation against a department and not against an individual who's not named. I think, um, you know, as I'm thinking about it, I think this scenario often comes up in cases that ultimately never reach you, where we're working with a department to try to get public records or try to get better agendas or minutes or whatever. And it's kind of a department issue, and, and maybe a few staff people can be the ones to implement uh, the changes or correct the changes, but we would be loath to, you know, name them um, personally or, you know, if we would send them, you know, send the matter to you. So, um, like I said, there are all kinds of wrinkles. Questions or comments from the commissioners for either the task force or staff? Is there any, to Mr. Minori, is there any problem with adopting all four? I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive as I'm looking at it. I mean, I guess it would be if a complaint came in against a department, not a name employee, we would say, okay, this is a complaint against not just the Ethics Commission, but it would be John St. Croix as well. And then the, and I'm sorry if I'm talking this through, but then the commission would decide, okay, um, was it non-willful? Was it willful? And that actually, well, it depends. If it was a chapter three, we'd be talking willful, could go down to non-willful. But if it was pure non-willful, we would, consider these uh, factors, and in the absence of something indicating that the department head was actually had a non-willful violation, you could then still have a non-willful violation by the department. I think that, I guess that makes sense. The only thing I would say is that, I know Ms. Christensen, I, I know she, uh, you might have insight on this. I, I'm not sure if you do or not, but you may want to say something because, um, Um, what I can say is, is, is that while this may ultimately not go into our personnel files if we are named, um, some of us didn't ask for our positions. We were assigned them. Um, and so, and I think that's true of a lot of the custodians. And I've heard banter about, well, perhaps the custodians would be named as opposed to the um, department heads. Um, and there's a range of custodians that go before uh, the task force, um, anywhere from Parks and Rec has a secretary uh, who goes to high-level managers who are acting as their department, um, their department's uh, custodians. Um, I'm the director of investigations for my department. I don't know how I ended up 
with this particular assignment, but I did. And I don't want it, I don't want to be named and have, and, and believe me, with 125 some odd um, issues that we're dealing with that have six to, to 10. I'm sorry, can I, can I just ask you to focus your comments? Are, are, is there a particular option that you don't want or you're advocating for? I'm, I'm advocating that you can have someone who's not named. Okay. Or where, or just the department. Yeah. So, so I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I and I, I'm not sure we need one if we have four. Um, if uh, I can't imagine a situation, oh, I'm having a hard time imagining such a situation where a department is named, um, and you find a willful violation against the department itself. Right, I mean, you'd, you'd need a person, wouldn't you, to get a willful violation, I would think. Um, so I, I kind of think if you've got four, then that helps this, the, the, the task force with this problem of not being able to figure out exactly who it is. And it does help us, too, because then when we get the referral, that's, I know we've wanted to do that on, on a few occasions because we don't think the department head was involved and isn't particularly helpful in the, in the analysis. Uh, so, to me, option four is a win-win, and uh, option three I'm comfortable with adopting uh, as well. Um, you know, option two, I, I, I have some hesitation about option two. If you don't have option one, I'm not sure you need it, and then it also makes me concerned that department heads are going to just completely wash their hands of all of this, because then they'll, they'll be... You know, they'll feel like the less involvement I have, the better, because then I'm, you know, n not going to be anywhere near this stuff. Where, where I want the department heads, I think, to feel like, that, look, they're ultimately in charge, and they should be caring about this and focusing on <coughs> this and um, would not want to disincentivize them from doing so. Mr. Hepner? If I could provide a comment on just wh on why I think option two is valuable. It, it's a... Uh, it's um, it's a based on sort of, uh, of employer employee uh, like vicarious liability factors. Um, it's a bit like respondeat superior the respondeat superior doctrine. And to the extent that a department head um, knew about a policy that was in place and let that policy stand and is responsible for the ratification of the actions of his employees, which I think is what option two is getting at. Um, I think that a department head should be held to task. It's the buck stops here um, idea. Without option two, all you have for finding a department head in violation, um, in only in a willful violation of the Sunshine Ordinance, is if that department head was directly involved in the records request. I, I, I'm not sure. It, it seems easier to me for a department head to wash his hands of any responsibility in that circumstance because I'm just not going to be involved with any records request. I'm not going to be involved with it at all. But option two gets at a situation where they can't wash their hands clean of a bad policy, uh, of a failed policy, and one that, that we have determined at the Sunshine Task Force um, to have been known by that department head to be bad and, and noncompliant uh, and that he ratified compliance with with uh, uh, an insufficient policy. So I actually think option two is in some ways more important than option three. Interesting. Uh, so, so and, and maybe I'm not reading this quite right. So, and Mr. Minardi, I could probably use some help from you on this. So what what is the answer to these enumerated um, statements in option two that leads to the non-willful violation? <clears throat> Say, whether the department had knew the record request. If he knew, then what? That, um, that militates in favor of a non-willful violation? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And if he knew that, um, and if the responding staff member was a direct report, that would counsel in favor of a non-willful? Exactly. And, and the same with the third? Exactly, right. So, I, 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 that, that's why I don't quite follow Mr. Hepner, because if, if, if he knows he can be found for a non-willful violation if he does all these things, and if he doesn't do all of these things, he can't be found even for a non-willful violation. Why would he or she be incentivized to, to, to do these things and be involved? Am I, tell me if I'm looking at it in a way that you think is wrong. But 
Well, it's funny because I thought they actually militated in, in favor of a, of a willful violation, but you can't find a willful violation because the department head was not directly involved with the request. So when it says, item number three, for instance, whether the department head had instituted sufficient Sunshine Ordinance compliance policies, um, if he had not or she had not instituted sufficient Sunshine Ordinance compliance policies, that militates in favor of a more egregious violation. Um, and so this should be yes, yes, no. Right, that's right. If the department had, yeah, right, correct. And if he had not, okay, I, I guess my personal view is option two could use some work. Um, I, because I, I think it probably could be crafted in a way that would make it useful, but I'm, I, I'm struggling. Mr. <clears throat> Andy, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I guess just to clarify, um, and I hope I'm not speaking out of place, but uh, just to, to following up on Mr. Hepner's last comment, so are you saying the three, three instances identified in option two would militate in favor of finding of a willful violation? Well, my assumption was that there was no way that there was going to be a willful violation, um, that there was no way that that was going to be adopted unless the department head was directly involved in responding. But that you could find, nevertheless, a non-willful violation if one, two, and not three. I actually think if you change three to say whether the okay. department head had instituted insufficient Sunshine Ordinance compliance policies, it's, it's a little bit... Um, clear. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Okay. But those all militate in favor of violation, which is not going to be deemed willful because the department head was not directly involved with the request. Doesn't this just tie our hands more, though? I mean, couldn't we find a non-willful violation of a department head for other reasons? And are you limiting yourself if you adopt this option well enter department or option number one right but but I think uh, it, which seems to be a catch-all in light of option number two yeah and I also to me it's a little redundant to option four and I'm not sure that's necessarily fair um, but I don't know if other commissioners want to weigh in or. <clears throat> I don't know if you want to do that. Yeah. One potential answer, I don't think it gets to your broader point, but, you know, we could have for option two, you know, the three factors could be, a, you know, including but not limited to type language. So it's indicative. Yeah. So those are the things that we look at generally, but, you know, if there's some, if there's some factor that's sort of overriding that we didn't, sort of contemplate ahead of time, you know, that it would, wouldn't tie the commission's hands. <clears throat> okay. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not necess I'm not opposed to that. I, you know, I don't think it's necessary, but as a, as a guidepost, I think it could be Valuable. So, so then we would say we would change sufficient to insufficient and add including but not limited to to option two. How does that sound to the task force? Yeah, I think it sounds it sounds much better. I'm. I'm uh, Conscious of the fact that that you know I don't have the full task force behind me right now, sure. um, but I think it's an improvement. Certainly. Is there a motion to? Oh, I guess we should. I'll move. <coughs> I'll move that we uh, adopt options two, three, two as amended, three and four as written. Second. Uh, public comment. All in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, that motion passes. Okay, option or uh, issue three. Okay, so the task force um, suggested option one regarding authorized representatives. Is that right? Yes, though I think it's worth clarifying and um, having read uh, former chairperson Hope Johnson's memorandum before coming here, I think um, she makes the point a bit clearer than I did. And I, and I think the issue I had with response, why, why my response to issue three was a bit garbled is because there's, it's a, it's a bit of a misnomer. What we're not, we're not looking for just an authorized representative. We need a knowledgeable representative. Um, we perform a very um, uh, intense but unfortunately constrained fact-finding mission in our hearings. We need somebody who can answer questions like what efforts were made to go through um, your staff person's emails for responsive records. We need somebody who knows the answer to a question like that at times, you know, and it certainly varies from request to request, but we need somebody who can really be knowledgeable about um, a complaint. Um, now, I'm also mindful that, that the possibility of this violation reaching the Ethics Commission seems the rarest of the three. Um, and and am, I, am I wrong on that regard? I, I think that it, 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 they're usually, they seem to be usually included with other violations. Okay. You, but we do see a fair number of them. Because, it, again, this, re, this is a scenario where, you know, by the time that it results in a referral to ethics, we've, you know, admonished the party, the respondent, numerous times to send a knowledgeable representative. Like, this is not working. That's why we need you at compliance and amendments so that you can tell us more and send somebody who knows. Not, not just an authorized representative. We've had situations in my limited experience where somebody will come and say, we, made a, we conducted a search for the records and we have, we have produced all responsive records and can't elaborate. That is, under some interpretations of authorized representative, an authorized representative. I think that, that might be option, option three, but it's certainly not going to suit our purposes of um, investigating the complaint and uh, everyone's purposes in coming to a more refined understanding of what issues are actually at play and what violations are necessary. Yes, we've had occasions where um, a staff person will come and read a statement and then be unable to go beyond that and had no, didn't even draft the statement, had no involvement whatsoever in anything. So there's not much we can do with that. You know, and uh, I can't, certainly can't speak for the departments, but, but one, one frustration I think that they likely have is without clear allegations at the outset, and I know you guys don't write the allegations, so it's, you know, it's, it's not the task, force, task force's fault, but, you know, they, they have a complaint that's not particularly clear. They come in, and then sort of the allegations more. So it's very hard, unless you are personally involved, to actually answer those questions. But clearly it does, the, the statute does permit an authorized representative. So therein lies the tension. I, you know, to, 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 I agree that it would be helpful if whoever went was prepared. Um, but in order to be prepared, if you weren't personally involved, you, you kind of need to know what the allegations are so you know what questions you can be prepared to answer. Um, so I think that's, that's a bit of the rub as, as far as I can see. And, and I think we addressed it in, in looping back to how we were talking about issue number one. Um, and, but something that Chair Washburn mentioned as well is that our uh, clerk and our administrator, Victor Young, and our city attorney collaborate on a memorandum that isolates a lot of the issues. It's not, it, it's better than what the original complaint stated. Um, uh, and, but it still necessitates that we do a lot of investigation and, and, and you know, uh, fact-finding. Uh, but that memorandum, which does go out to the respondents, 
is usually good enough. I would say in, in most cases it's good enough to put the respondent on notice of who to send to respond to the allegations. Um, and that rarely, and, and acknowledging that we see so many complaints, but rarely um, you get this instance where just the person can't talk about it at all, and it, it's not enough. I can't help but think that the spirit behind authorized representative, that terminology, was somebody who knows what is going on, um, who can give us some direction. What is that document called that they will get in advance of appearing before you? You, you refer to it as a memorandum? I, I believe it's a, a, the memorandum. It just says memorandum on top, and it's from the city attorney and our administrator to the respondent. Right, and it um, summarizes the complaint, although sometimes the city attorney will, or DCA will say he's not sure what exactly the complainant wants. We'll have the relevant law, sections of the ordinance, state law. Um, we'll cite case law if there's any that's relevant for us. We'll suggest lines of inquiry to us. And then along with that are all the supporting documents that the, com the complainant has produced and the respondent. So that's, that's the package that we get beforehand. But the memorandum, I know I re rely heavily on it um, to help me start thinking about the case before we have the hearing. And th this is the city attorney's memorandum to the respondent? To the task force. To the task force. Right. And does the, uh, the respondent receive it as well? Yes. In advance of? This is all part of the um, agenda package that's posted on our website um, in advance of the meeting. Uh, so, okay, I understand that it would be posted for, for, for the public, but do they, are they sent, is the respondent sent the? I'm, the, yes, the respondents are sent a copy of the agenda prior to appearing at the, com, at the task force hearing. We get a copy of the agenda, but we don't get the city attorney's opinion in it. The write up. We, we have to pull that down off of uh, the website five days before the complaint. We, we also receive it five days before the complaint. And, and the way we receive it is we receive what appears to be a PDF um, in an email. And each of the file numbers is, in fact, a link. It's a bit of a disguised link. I don't know if that's. If you've ever tried to click on the <laughs> well, What I do is I pull the full packet down, put it in a right. binder, and go through it. And it's always inclusive of the city attorney's um, write-up. OK. It, do you have a view? Is, is that memo usually uh, sort of sufficient to identify the salient allegations in your experience? Not, no. Not necessarily, Not? no. Um, I information comes in after we get that. We generally get the. Um, notice of the meeting, meeting or much earlier than the five days. Um, and so it comes to us to give us the, the heads up that we need to be at the task force. It gives a, a statement of who's um, complaining and maybe a line about the complaint, but it's not necessarily enough to really know what the issue is. Okay. Unless the Ethics Commission think that it is this amorphous throughout. I'll just remind you that this is at the outset of our procedure where we hear the complaint. And, and Ms. Christensen has appeared before us um, a, a, a couple times this year. Um, and I know that she's inundated with sunshine and or uh, you know, public records requests. Ms. Christensen is certainly a knowledgeable representative who has been very valuable when she comes to speak to the task force. And it assists us in helping to navigate what exactly the issue is. And, you know, in many cases, it's not an issue aside from an entity like Ms. Christensen's being battered by public records requests, um, as is the public's right, of course. But, I, you know, the, the understanding is there. It's just that they, even if they start off somewhat amorphous, they take, they, it, it requires a knowledgeable representative for them to take shape. So, so what if we had something like the person has to make a good faith effort to be prepared to respond to the allegations in whatever you call that memo, the city attorney's memo? Um, it, 
you know, because I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to what Ms. Christensen, Christensen is saying here and, and what you, Mr. Hedmer, just said. I mean, if, if, if you don't even know at the outset, it's very hard to find that the person who comes violated the ordinance because they didn't even understand, because you didn't even know what really the allegations were. Right, uh, and, and, so. it's, and to be fair, though, it is, it is a very mixed bag. Some are much clearer than others. Um, and in instances where we find a 67.21e violation for failure to send an authorized representative, that's usually an instance where, um, in my experience, it's how could you not send a knowledgeable representative? You know, I, I, we will exercise discretion if it is so amorphous that, okay, I get it. You, you're not sure either. I get that. But if it's something as clear as one individual requesting their personnel file um, and, you know, that that is a pretty cut and dry public records request within boundaries then then it's easier to find a violation of 67.21e when the person's like well i, I had nothing to do i i don't know what's going sure, on sure and i understand that there are you're right there are a range of different possibilities but in terms of the the commission adopting a policy that sort of helps clarify what this sure. means i think adding in some sort of good faith requirement to to just be prepared good faith requirement to you know, be prepared to respond to the allegations in the memo, I, I, I think it is fair and, and understand, comprehensible, at least. Uh, I don't know what other members of the commission or Mr. Minardi think. Any objection to that? You look, you look skeptical, no. which concerns me. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think in terms of, I, I mean, a good faith effort. I'm just trying to think in terms of, you know, the commission uh, having one of these allegations before it, you know, judging what's good faith and what's not good faith. But I, I suppose that's a factual issue you could you could judge. Um, should we say prepared to respond to the allegations in the city attorney's memo? Yes. <clears throat> At least state the response. So long as that person, so long as that person is prepared to respond to the allegations in the city attorney's memo, I mean, I'll leave it to you guys to tell sure. us what what that's formally called. My, my, with respect to the to the good faith comment, just because I've, I've been trying to think about it very quickly, I, I think by the time a sixty seven point two one e violation gets to you, bad faith should be presumed that for a 67.21e. That would have been an instance where we requested over and over again for somebody else to come speak to us, and they refused to do so. Um, now, um, with respect to uh, somebody who's prepared, uh, what was the, the language that you had suggested? Pre prepared to respond to allegations in the memo, whatever we call that memo. We'll, we'll give it the formal name. but So, so that... You know, if Ms. Ms. Christensen comes, you, she, she downloaded the packet, she saw the, the memo, and she's prepared to address what's in there. If you guys raise things that aren't in there, maybe she'll, she can go back and do more homework, but you can't hold her in violation of 67.21e for not being able to answer those additional questions. That, that would sort of be my view of it. I think that sounds reasonable. A more usual scenario is a usual scenario is that the department says sends nobody. Nobody comes to the hearing. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's the that, other. That's that awesome. happened. That, that happened tonight. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Pu public comment on issue three. Um, is there a motion to uh, adopt? Option two as amended. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, that motion passes. Thanks again to uh, the task force, to Ms. Christensen for coming, <laughs> being here all night, uh, and the staff, I, I thought, did a great job as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Hefner, nice to meet you, and thanks again for the memo. Minutes. Um, 
if I may, I missed a typo that I'd like to bring to your attention. At the bottom of page two, the very last paragraph, David Pilpel stated that it would have been to receive. I think the word nice belongs between the word been and the word to. Sorry, you're not all caught up with me. Unbelievable. <laughs> Any other comments on the minutes? Public comment on the minutes? Is there a motion to adopt the minutes as uh, amend as proposed uh, to be amended? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Hearing none, that motion passes. Executive Director's report. Um, I'm not going to do any highlights because you have a plane to catch, so. No, you can do highlights. I have time. Yeah. It's 10.30 flight. Um, actually, I don't think I have any anyway. <laughs> don't blame me. <laughs> so uh, in the mayor putting, I, did he already put out his uh, his instructions, right? Formally yeah. put out his. And, <clears throat> and there last are, week. There last, are week. No cuts. last week. So there are no cuts for city Correct. departments. Now, where does, it, where does that leave us with outstanding positions? And I thought there was a reduction that we were we were proposing, I don't know if we were proposing it, but being pre getting prepared for. So staffing wise, are we, are we fully staffed? We still have an open investigator position. We had funding for that in the last fiscal year, mm -hmm. but we didn't fill it because we didn't know if we get funding in the fiscal year we're in now, mm -hmm. and we didn't. So, um, <coughs> you know, the budget directions are to submit basically the same budget. Mm -hmm. We don't always do that. In fact, we seldom do. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a budget proposal for the commissioners to talk about in January. Got it. I don't, I don't understand that. Does that mean because the position wasn't filled this year and the money wasn't paid for that position, you've lost that money? Well, we used a lot of it for other things. It was, I mean, it was, there was no line item that said the money had to be used for that. So we used it toward other staffing and, and other expenses. You used a lot of it. Did you yeah. use all of it? No. So that which you didn't use because of the mayor's instructions to you now, you're not going to get? Well, that's, no, that was last year's budget. The, the money's not in the budget year that we're in now. So we're not going to lose anything we have this year. But last year, I think we used all but $30,000 of our budget. So is the question more, are you, are you going to make the decision for this upcoming year to hire the investigator? Well, it depends on what our budget is in, you know, announced in June for the fiscal year that starts in July. But is it your intention as the executive director? Yeah, well, and when we do our budget proposal, I'm going to ask you to authorize a request for more than one additional staff. Okay. You know, we'll be, we'll be looking see. at more than that. Okay, okay good. Anything else on the executive director's report? Uh, public comment? Items for future meetings? Anything that the commissioners would like to add in the future? Public comment? Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes. The meeting is adjourned.